There's a, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, I think because my, my N is small. I only used one motor and it didn't fail. So, but what it appears is there's a couple of things. One is that with these little motors, they're brushed motors, right? They're, they're brushed DC motors. And I think the brushes are wearing out after a couple hours. And I think these motors, I believe, are since they're a buck and a half each, are meant to be popped out of the quadcopter and you stuff a new one in. So they're, they're disposable motors, essentially. And so running them for shorter times is a good idea. You test the, the, the impulse response, you turn it on, you let it do settle, you calculate what needs to be done, you turn it off, you, do, you recompile or you reset the parameters, you test again. And the other thing is to keep the voltage down probably to four and a half volts or so. And don't, don't rev it up to as high as the power supply will go. Um, <clears throat> but I don't really know. I have more motors. You're welcome to swap one out if you, if you, if you, if you think that it's dead. Let me know. I also put up a post on Piazza that said, uh, uh, let me take apart these projects and put them away because that way I can find the parts next year. If you throw the screws in one bin and, uh, and the brackets in another bin, I'll never find them. So let me take them apart. You stack them up in a big pile, I'll take them apart. I find it therapeutic at the end of the semester to take apart hardware. It's, it's relaxing and uh, and uh, meditative. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Had a question about ECE 4920, which is uh, technical writing for people who have taken 4760. <clears throat> and in that class, what you do is you take your final project report that you wrote this semester. And you convert it into a magazine article to be published. You choose the journal or the magazine that you want to target. And then when you do that, you download the style guide for that journal or magazine. You follow the style guide. You rewrite the paper rather almost 100%, in fact, for the style guide. And when it meets my criterion, then you send it off, you submit it. And it doesn't matter whether it gets published or not in terms of your grade, that you won't know that for weeks or months after you actually submit it anyway. But uh, it's an interesting way of, alternate way of meeting the college writing requirement, technical writing requirement that allows you to leverage your project. Uh, 2015, which is the last year for which I have full statistics, we got seven or eight projects into print. Last year's projects are just coming in now. So this, uh, the writing projects are in the spring. You figure six months to get into print. Um, they're just coming in now. We have two, two so far this year. One last month, one this month. So there is a page which describes the process because I put everything on the web so I can find it. On my home page there's a link to EC4920. This tells you everything you have to do and what will happen to you if you don't actually turn in drafts on time. Because there are, last semester, last year there were 20 groups all writing different things. I have to meet with them all every two weeks or so, or three weeks, depending. And because of that, I can't have anybody slip schedule. You sign up for a time, you're there. But it's, uh, but there's a lot of uh, sort of personal attention here because there's no economy of scale. 
Everybody's writing something different. I sit down with the, the group, one, two, or three people. We go through every word, mark it up, you take it back and write it again. Do that typically two to three times, occasionally four or five. Uh, <laughs> by the, after the fifth time, I say, you're done. Right, you're gonna take a grade hit, you're done. Because typically that means people aren't, aren't doing much on each draft, right? That means they're not paying attention. So it's, a, it's, a, it's fun. I, I put on here the, the there's the histogram of number of revisions necessary. Nobody got done with one. Although there are a couple that were pretty close. Last year, two people got done, two groups got done with two drafts. Most people were up in the three or four drafts, 15 and 14 respectively. And then there, were, uh, there was one person that took five drafts. All of the information is there. Take a look at it. See if you're interested. We've, we typically, I think there was 30 people in 20 groups last year. So, any questions on lab four at this point? Mostly working? Yeah? Just one last um, lingering question. It's from Kevin Error. Um, what's your thoughts on whether to use um, ADC units or um, degree units? Because it seems like degree units has one third of the resolution but less noise. So if you use integer arithmetic, then it makes sense to use ADC units because then everything is in integers that you can represent. If you use degrees, then you almost have to use floating point. Then the question is, can you make the deadline? Can you make the deadline for the interrupt service routine? And the only way to find that out is to profile it. I don't know if you can make the deadline with using all floating point. Does anybody know? Has anybody profiled? Has it, did anybody use floating point? Did it run at a thousand hertz? Yeah. You know that for sure. How did you know that? How'd you profile it? We didn't. It just didn't have any issues. I mean, we only did like. All right, all right. For for the write up, you better make sure you know that it was running at a kilohertz. Yeah. How would you do that? Just calculate the load inside that. I don't think you can calculate the load. I think it's uh, too hard to do. You measure the load. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So one way to do that is, of course, just toggle an I.O. pin in the interrupt. See how fast it toggles. Mm -hmm. If it's toggling at 500 hertz, it's missing every other interrupt. If it's toggling at a kilohertz, you're making the deadline. There's better ways to do it too. You can obviously you can you can read t timers. Anything else on lab four? So I had a request to talk about uh, about uh, serial uh, using UART. So I uh, I whipped together a little web page on that last night, and. The UART is a device that is another serial deserializer like SPI. So you have a connection, uh, an 8 bit connection to the bus, which goes into a short FIFO, 8 or 16 entries. Then the output of the FIFO goes into a shift register which is clocked out at the baud rate least significant bit first
onto one pin. <clears throat> so you are converting the an 8-bit number, a character, a car variable, into a serial stream and blasting it out of one bit. There's also a matching shift register which takes data back in. So this is a so-called TX line, this is an RX line. There's a shift register that that reserializes or, or deserializes, deserializes the RX back into an 8-bit number which goes onto the bus. And this is full duplex. You can transmit and receive at the same time. There is no clock. No, it's separate pins. So the the XC32 compiler, which is what we're using, assumes that that UART2 is the console device. It, it routes all I.O. to UART2. UART2 has a, uh, a, a U2 TX pin and a U2 RX pin, which are settable through PPS. So you can put them on many, at least on eight different output pins each. And you can hook these guys up in various ways. For instance, if you have a two PIC 32s and you want them to communicate, you could do it with two pins. You take the transmit on one, hook it to the receive on the other, and the transmit on the second one, hook it to the receive on the first, and you have a bi-directional communication path. You can set this up pretty fast. The fastest speed you can run the system is system clock divided by four. So in principle, you could run this at uh, 10 megabits per second, but not for very far maybe a foot or so. So the protocol looks like this. The, the output pin rests at 3 volts when nothing is happening. When you <coughs> load the register, when you load the FIFO with a value, that value, that, that load causes a start bit to be sent a one clock start bit. The edge of the start bit starts the clock on the receiving end. There is no clock sent between the, transmit, between the transmitter and the receiver. Rather, the clock is regenerated on the receive end. So the, the falling edge of the start bit starts the clock. It sends the bit, obviously, from the transmit end. When the receiver sees that, it starts its clock, which suggests that the two clocks need to be matched fairly closely between transmit and receiver. And in fact, for valid communication, you have to have about the two clock rates be within about 2% of each other. The edges have to be within about 2% all the way through. <coughs> then you send 8 bits in least significant bit first format. Then you send a stop bit, which is one more downtime followed by a rising edge. When the receiver gets the rising edge of the stop bit, then the receiver knows that there is a valid character available and can signal an operating system or signal the threader or throw an interrupt or do various other things to signal the receiver that this asynchronous event, no clock, can happen at any time, has, has occurred. It's a really simple protocol, yeah. So I'm kind of confusing the whole fact of like, so if, if it, let's just say like you wanted one PIC32 to just speak to another one, um, and you didn't really need the receiving end, like what would that be sending if you're not really reading anything? <clears throat> so it's being received by something. What's it being received by? Another pick? 
No, so let's say just we had the one pick on the left, like just talking the other one on the right, kind of like master slave. Okay, so it's so it's transmitting out of here, receiving here, and never com talking back. That's fair. That's valid. Okay, so but then you said that the receivers was sig signaling the end of each character, so it knows it's not signaling back. It's signaling internally, so it knows that the character is done because there's no there's no frame, right? There's not like there's no chip select here. There's no framing that says communication's done. The way it knows communication's done is the tenth transition occurs internally. These can be back to back, so the very next bit after a stop bit can be a start bit for the next character. So you can run this thing flat out at whatever the bit rate or baud rate as we say the baud rate is and so uh, so for a standard 9600 baud rate for a PC you'd expect to get about 960 characters a second that's about a screen full a second that's about as fast as you can read or maybe a little faster You can crank this up though, if there's two picks talking to each other, like I said, you can go at quite a, high, a bit higher rate. I linked up the, the section on the UART, and if you're actually going to use this, you probably want to look at some of this a little bit, some of the UART baud rate generator, and in particular, if you decide to do something really twisted, and use this as a network you can hook together a bunch of pick 32s in this weird configuration where you have all the transmits and all the receives hooked together on one wire pulled up gently and it's painful to think about isn't it and a transmitter then pulls down the pulls down the line but the but this uh, resistor pulls it back up and you have to come up with a scheme for addressing the 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 various these are all symmetric so even though it says master slave there is there, there's complete symmetry here anybody can be in charge at any time so you need a scheme for setting an address and setting who's in charge and there is such a an extension to UART on this architecture you're allowed to produce a 9-bit mode you put the thing in 9-bit mode and you have to tell the receiver that this is now address mode also or 9-bit mode the ninth bit then if it's set tells the system that what was just sent was an address and all of the slaves should look at that address and see if they get a match. If they get a match, they, auto, they can be set to automatically turn on the receive transmit function. And that would happen like every transmission? They would know that they So, so the first time you do that, the first time you send a 9-bit number, then, then everybody evaluates to find out whose address it is and that address is valid until the next 9-bit number is sent. So it's persistent. Now, one way this is used quite a lot in a <coughs> class like this and in general in industry is to treat this data stream as a as a serial stream for a human display so you're not talking machine to machine as this suggests but rather you're talking between between a PIC32 and a PC so in this case the PIC32 <coughs> would be talking TX RX out to a an adapter uh, made by a bunch of different companies FTDI makes them a whole bunch of companies make them that takes in UART on one side 
and converts it to USB COM port on the other side. So then you're gonna run a USB cable off to your PC where you're gonna run some piece of software, often putty. You know putty? Putty. Putty is a <coughs> is a term is a terminal emulator program. It takes in serial code and formats it as text on the screen. You can then type on the PC keyboard. It gets sent back over the link and acts as input to the PIC32. It's a nice way of doing character-oriented I.O. It's such a nice way to do character-oriented I.O. that I, 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 I wrote it into um, Proto threads. And I haven't talked about that because we haven't used it. But there are proto threads functions that set up the com the communication for you. And but more importantly, the the functions allow you to do non-blocking print and read from the console. And the reason you need non-blocking print and read is that the default printf, you know that printf that everybody uses for everything for debugging, is blocking. Once it starts to execute, nothing else can execute. So the, so the, so the, uh, so thread stops. It's not so bad for a print because you can bound it. You know that at 9600, each character is going to take a millisecond. So print F for 10 characters is going to take 10 milliseconds. You can bound it. You can figure out what's going to go on. The hard part is, what if you're asking for input and the user goes out to launch? Right, then you have an unbounded wait time for, the, for input from the console keyboard. <coughs> and so for that, it is essential that you be able to stop the thread and go ahead and execute other threads. You want to block the thread that's waiting for input. You have to block the thread that's waiting for input. But you want other threads like timekeeping threads to keep executing. So I wrote a bunch of support stuff to do that. Now, the downside is I wrote it before we were using the big board. And so the I.O. pin I chose and, and, and used last year doesn't work on the big board. So I'm rewriting ProtoThread's header uh, this morning. I'll probably have it done by tomorrow. And uh, it changes, the, t it changes the, the RX pin, U2 RX pin, to a pin that's not used by the, by the development board. Yeah. Can this same UR uh, design here that you're showing be used for Bluetooth? So, so the question is, is this usable with a Bluetooth module? Yes. Many Bluetooth modules are, are designed to go to a UART connection. And this would work with a 3-volt Bluetooth module. Most are 3 volts. Won't work 5-volt. Work with 3-volt Bluetooth module. It would also work with a Wi-Fi module. It'll, work, it'll send data to uh, uh, RF24, NRF24 module that you probably used in 3400. Remember that? Uh, it's used for lots of intermodule communication. Some Bluetooth uses SPI, some uses I2C, but many of them just use the, the, the UART. So you could set up protothreads to talk directly to a Bluetooth module, yeah. On the PC end, there's some stuff you have to do. Putty, as I said, is a terminal emulator. It, er it emulates a VT100, which was uh, the last one I saw was thrown down the stairs at the Theory Center about 20 years ago. Uh, a VT100 
emulates a ADM3 terminal, which in turn emulates a teletype, which is a, a, me a fully mechanical device with no electron, no transistors. So this is like uh, a four a four level deep emulation, but the overall effect is you set up a you, you connect a COM port to a typing window and you can see what the the PIC32 is sending and you can type back to it. There's a little interface module uh, that I didn't use this year for a couple of reasons. One is they're fairly expensive. They're 17 or 18 dollars each and I lose half of them every year. I got tired of buying that many. But takes a UART connection in through three of these wires. You do not ever connect the red wire to anything on the microcontroller because it's plus five from the USB. And then this end goes into the PC. It does the, so this end looks like a serial COM port. This end looks like a UART. They're really nice. From the ProtoThreads standpoint, <clears throat> there will be a new version of ProtoThreads when I get done with this. It'll be called one underscore two underscore two and do I get to make a new version if you had something like this last year? Because it's, it's on the big board uh, and who knows two years from now I might throw away the big board so I keep all the versions. I've got versions of software going back now 20 years. Will I ever look at it again? Nah. So, a couple of things you have to do in config.h, you have to make sure that the define use UART serial is turned on and define a baud rate, in this case 9600 baud. <clears throat> and when you configure putty on the PC end, that number has to match within 2%. So the number on, that you're going to enter on the putty end when you set up putty on the PC is 9600. <clears throat> then the, the header, the main header which sets up all of the grody details for the threader down near the bottom has a section that sets up the the serial port and does various obscure things like clear screen clear screen is printf backslash xlb right bracket 2J. What in the hell is that? It's actually X1B. It turns out that that's an escape code for VT100 which emulates uh, a, a function on a teletype which puts in a new page of paper. And a few other things, but But th the main piece of it is that there are functions for sending and receiving in a non-blocking fashion. And there is a section which sets up all of the I.O. junk for the UART for you. It's and this one is now wrong. U2RX cannot be RPB11 because that's used for the TFT data line. So. I'm cha I changed it to RA1 in the 2 underscore 2 version and that seems to work fine. And it configures the UART, it sets the line control, it sets the data rate, it enables the pins, and then it prints a message to make sure that everything is correct. You could disable that, you don't have to print that message, but you may want to. There are the input 
the input function, the read string function, the read string function, which is fairly long, get, it's called get serial buffer, and it yields after every stop bit. So it takes one character and it yields because I don't think any of you can type faster than 20 characters a second. And that's glacially long for the, for the CPU. So the, the thread yields after every stop bit until the next start bit. Until the next stop bit, actually. For sending, I tried two different schemes because I was playing around. One does a put serial buffer and it yields after every, after the transmitter is loaded on every character. You load one character, then you yield because it takes a millisecond to send it. So 40,000 instructions. So during that time you can go execute another thread. But there was a better way to do it, which I then implemented, which was DMA put serial buffer, <coughs> which starts a transfer to the serial buffer and then just yields until the whole string is transmitted because the DMA is smart enough to stop a transfer on a character match value and the end of a string in C is always hexadecimal zero. So the DMA stops when it reaches the end of the string and then uh, signals signals that the thread can execute again. So in the, at the user level then what this looks like is fairly straightforward. This is a, an application that's really boring. All it does is blink LEDs. But the control, the control system is the following, and, and it uses a, a output to the, so where do I set that up? Oh, it's just PT setup. PT setup, because I enabled the U serial, PT setup sets up the serial for me. I don't do anything. I don't handle any of that grody stuff. I just come back here and if I do a, if I spawn a thread for DMA output, so set up sprintf, I use the PT, uh, use a printf, sprintf to load the send buffer with the string command bracket or le right, uh, right arrow and then do a DMA output, it'll send that string and sp by spawning a thread and then when the thread exits, execution continues. And the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to spawn another thread which does a get serial buffer to get the user input and the thread dies and returns when the user types enter. So when we come back then we can use scanf to parse the term buffer into a string and, a, and an integer in this case or anything else that you want. And then there's a command parser which said for for five different values of command T, B, S, W, and P do something. Signal a thread or spawn a thread or in this case do something very kind of unstructured and do a printf directly from the thread. You can do this. This is not, this is not illegal but it blocks the thread. And in this case I figured it was okay because this blocks the thread for about 10 milliseconds and it's in a user interface thread which is so slow from the users, uh, the user is so slow that an extra 10 milliseconds doesn't matter. So from the user's point of view, 
you the entire interface is to write something spawn a thread to read something spawn a thread both these threads are non blocking the timer keeps running TFT update keeps running sorry it's all right and uh, but this thread waits until the information until the, the user presses enter so it's fairly straightforward I got this uh, I, I So I took the code that I'd had for the for the non big board value, plugged in the adapter cable, programmed to change the R, the pin to RA11, RPA11, RPA1 rather, compiled knowing it was going to work, and it didn't. And the reason was that I was blinking an LED using A1, and so that was jamming the UART input. And as soon as I turned that off, then it worked. Uh, it's um, it's easy to set up. You might uh, you might enjoy using it, particularly if you need to go out to a module. If you're going to go to a Bluetooth module or a Wi-Fi module, you can do it directly and non-blocking from th uh, Proto Threads. It'll help you get that set up. There's a couple of more examples, but it's really, uh, that's refreshingly straightforward. And I'll document, so the, the new version will be there, and I'll document what, what changed and uh, what other dependencies there are. So any questions about this? As long as you, you, it, so the other question is, are the old lab codes compatible? If you used RA1 for anything, you'll have to remap my receive pin to another pin. I chose RA1 because I didn't use it in my example. If you used RA1 for something like a button in lab four, or for or or for reading an analog conversion then you'll have to choose another IO line and modify the proto threads header to <coughs> account for the the reuse maybe I should move that to the config file maybe I'll do that at least that way you don't have to go pawing through a, a pile of code to find it I'll do that it's the only dependency I know of. That being said, I haven't yet tested against the TFT code, which I'll probably do tom tomorrow. Any more questions? As with all these things, you can set up the UART, bare metal, no threader, just do the config and it'll run. However, and, and you know, some of you may, may end up doing that, but generally speaking, the, the ProtoThreads interface is going to be more efficient to use in the long run because I already figured out how to do the swapping and the, and the, uh, the, 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 the thread swapping to make it efficient. As an aside, I uh, Dreamweaver stopped working on me uh, a couple of days ago. There's something incompatible now with whatever w version of Windows I'm running. So I downloaded a new version, and now I know exactly nothing on how to use it. 
every single detail is different. Just kill me. I just, there now seems to be two selection modes, block and text. I'm inferring this, by the way. I'm, I'm, I haven't actually been able to find the damn documentation yet. So bear with me on web pages. They might be a little funny looking for a couple of days. <coughs> Anything else? How about uh, final project? As I said, the, the budget limit is going to be $125. Did I actually change that on the, on the, on the assignment yet? Oh, it says $100. No, it's now $125. I, I'll change that. I forgot to change that. Assuming I can make Dreamweaver change that. And... Uh, Remember, for, the, for the, the Tuesday folks, final project starts today. Next week, next Tuesday, expect a progress report. What you did this week. Anything else? Yes? Um, how noisy are servos? Pardon me? So, how noisy are, are, are $10 servos? Uh, uh, generally, they, so they're, they have an internal uh, feedback unit, and they tend to quiver at, at around uh, 2 or 5 degrees noise. However, if you, they have a fairly high holding torque. If you set them and then turn off the pulse train completely, they'll stay there with zero noise. They just don't have as much holding torque. So if you have a fairly low torque application, you can, you can turn the thing noisily to a position and then just turn it off and let it sit there and it'll be quiet. One other thing about servo motors, I see people all the time dorking with the servo motors. They'll get a servo motor, they'll put a wheel on it to go ee 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 run that wheel back and forth. And there's a gear train inside that has like a hundred to one reduction. And as you torque that thing back and forth, you're spinning up this motor back and forth in different directions and you will blow out, you will destroy the gear train in short order by physically torquing a servo motor back and forth. Don't do it. It is a number one failure mode for 3,400 servos after overvoltaging. Anything else? Oh, I uh, just by way of of reference, I have tried to produce a page for each of the different peripherals on the PIC-32. You might find some useful information here if you're, if you're say, want to set up the real-time clock with a 32768 hertz crystal or use the charge time measurement unit. Did anybody run across this page? It's clearly there. I haven't hidden it. It happens to make lab one twice as easy. I just, I leave that as a, as a tidbit in there to see if anybody finds it. CTMU is a really interesting unit that injects a constant current onto an ADC pin. Therefore, if you put a resistor on that ADC pin, you have an ohm meter. If you put a capacitor on it and charge for a certain amount of time, you have a capacitance meter. Because it's a constant current source, the voltage is linear with capacitance then. It's really handy. You might want to look through some of this stuff if you're if you're going to do something wacky with the I.O. this will at least give you a, a way of finding out what you're talking about. The power management section is interesting and completely bewildering because it's scattered throughout three documents. I'll talk about that if you want to. Then I've done some other specific applications you might be interested in. 
neural modeling uh, in the, in, uh, using the Izykovich neural model, uh, a bunch of digital signal processing, including measuring the transfer function of a RC circuit, uh, some speech compression and playback, uh, music synthesis, spectral analysis, voice analysis. If you want to talk to me about DSP, come talk. I, 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 I enjoy DSP a lot because it's all differential equations. <laughs> and uh, also I got some pixel strip displays running for the uh, for two kinds of uh, pixel strips. Uh, I like the uh, dot stars a lot better. These guys. These are beautiful. They're bright and they're easy to drive, but they ain't cheap. A meter of them is a 75 bucks. <coughs> Pardon me? Neopixels are really cheap. Neopixels are really cheap and you and worth every penny of it. They're really hard to drive. I went so far as to put weight statements made of op code, uh, no ops, into, and it's a beating. It works. It's just you wish you didn't have to do it. So take a look at some of this stuff. If you want to talk more about music synthesis, let me know. I'll be happy to chat with it. Otherwise, let's go down to the lab. <laughs>